I should just say that my background and my research interests, as Ala has, has set out, um, provide a little context for the approach that I've kind of opted to take uh, for this lecture. Um, particularly, as I'm aware that I guess the vast majority of the audience are probably, luckily, maybe um, not lawyers or necessarily legally trained. Um, so I want to give a bit of background just to explain the, the choice that I've kind of adopted in uh, taking this particular focus. So fundamentally, uh, I myself am I'm an EU lawyer. Um, I have a particular interest in uh, consumer law, in data protection and in fundamental rights. Um, and I'm interested in these areas of regulation, not only in terms of um, the substantive rights that are attributed to individuals by virtue of international, e European Union uh, and national law, um, but also in how these rights in practice can be relied upon and enforced by individuals. Right, that's to say, um, as Alan mentioned, I'm interested in international adjudication um, and I'm interested in what we term the procedural law framework that facilitates this uh, enforcement. And this, you can see, is reflected in the title of my lecture, right? As it suggests, um, the, the kind of task that I've uh, given myself this morning is to present on the anti-discrimination framework, essentially the legal framework that provides individuals with rights to uh, equal treatment and non-discrimination and its place uh, in the regulation of AI-based decision-making. That is, I take a very broad understanding of um, what AI-based decision-making is, essentially data-driven uh, decision-making. Um, as our previous uh, lectures um, yesterday and our previous discussions within the context uh, of the No Bias project have suggested. Um, the breadth of uh, the topic of legal regulation is in itself uh, pretty considerable, right? It's pretty significant. And this is also reflected, I think I should be able to Yeah, um, this is also reflected in uh, the um, presentations of two of the legal researchers who are, uh, well, nevertheless, uh, engaged in um, interdisciplinary research, who are undertaking uh, primarily legal research um, on the analysis and evaluation of the, the, the um, frameworks of the legal, legal regulation of uh, AI. Um, Alejandra, who's, who I'm working with at Southampton, um, is exploring these uh, challenges arising from the so-called black box theory, um, including the right to information um, and the right to explanation and trying to identify where these rights um, might exist or where they might uh, derive from. And Ioana, um, equally, who's, who's engaged in um, these really complex uh, legal issues of mitigating bias um, at the national and EU levels. Um, as this topic of legal regulation um, is such a considerable one, it's really not uh, a topic to which um, justice can really be done in, in the space of one hour and, and 30 minutes, right? And, and I think this is true even if we try to narrow down the focus uh, further to focus on more specifically, the, the, the anti-discrimination framework, the, the framework which provides for these rights to equality and rights uh, to non-discrimination. And that's to say also putting to the side these um, other uh, interrelated yet distinct areas of legal regulation like data protection law, like consumer law, like competition law, and so on and so forth. So um, my proposal today uh, is to adopt a kind of twofold approach. Instead of um, providing a very broad and superficial overview of uh, anti-discrimination law, I instead propose to try to, to tackle this topic from a particular perspective. That's to say by integrating the substantive and procedural law dimensions of anti-discrimination um, with a focus on the enforcement uh, of these uh, equality rights. Nevertheless, um, in light of the, the kind of mixed uh, background of the audience, I think it's necessary and relevant to provide uh, an outline of, of the general framework of anti-discrimination law. And I'll do this in the first part of the lecture before then uh, turning um, to the uh, procedural law challenges. Um, uh, so 
I should just note that normally I should be able to click these through these slides, but it doesn't seem uh, to be working. But never, nevertheless, um, what I mean by the procedural law dimension or the procedural law framework? Um, as I said, substantive EU law, including the overarching fundamental rights framework um, and anti-discrimination discrimination law in particular, attribute certain rights to individuals. Um, essentially, in the context of anti-discrimination, uh, the, the right not to be discriminated against, right? If you satisfy certain uh, conditions, which I'll come back to uh, uh, later. However, um, these rights are really only effective and really only have purpose when they can be relied upon and effectively enforced by individuals. And this entails an examination of uh, this procedural law framework, right? The legal processes and legal rules by which um, the substantive law rights can be enforced within a particular uh, legal jurisdiction, as well as the potential obstacles that are posed by these uh, procedural law rules. Um, why have I chosen uh, to adopt this focus? Um, there are kind of three reasons. On the one hand, notwithstanding that I think already the anti-discrimination law framework and the extent to which it can be engaged to regulate um, AI-based decision-making is under-researched, I think uh, the procedural law dimensions of that framework are even more under-researched. Uh, and to that end, I should, uh, I should say that this, in preparing for this presentation, it's really brought to the fore a number of, um, of avenues of further research, right? So some of these, some of the, the um, points that I will make today are really, I think, at least for me at the, the, the infancy, there's a lot of research still to be done um, on this particular topic. Uh, Sorry, Stephanie, which, which slides should the participants be viewing? Uh, still, the the still the introductory one, still the introductory Still the introductory, okay, perfect. Um, Good. Yeah, uh, secondly, um, it's worth noting that the enforcement of substantive rights, substantive legal rights by private individuals um, is generally undertaken within a particular national legal system, right? And so requires a focus um, on a, partic a particular set of national procedural rules uh, and processes. Um, for lawyers, that typically means, and for procedural lawyers, and uh, more specifically, that typically means that they look to their um, to their own legal system, uh, potentially sometimes engaging in some comparative uh, civil procedure um, exercises. Uh, for the purposes of this lecture, I will look in more detail at uh, the law of English procedure, English civil procedure. It's not necessarily my own legal system, but it's kind of, I guess, for the moment, um, my adopted one, uh, and make further reference to, uh, to other um, mostly EU uh, legal systems where uh, it's relevant. Um, it's also worth noting, and we'll see throughout the lecture, that um, at least across, or at least within the European Union context, there is uh, a degree of harmonization uh, entailing a degree of uniformity as regards the substantive rights uh, on which individuals uh, can rely. However, when it comes to procedural law, the harmonization and the endeavours of the European Union legislator in um, lawmaking in the realm of procedure uh, is much more limited, which implies, um, I think quite importantly, uh, that the enforcement of these substantive rights might uh, in fact diverge across national legal systems giving rise to potentially a problematic uh, degree of uh, diversity, not only obviously within and across the EU, but, uh, but necessarily uh, globally. Um, so a quick word on structure. Um, yeah, so in order first to uh, delve into how these uh, EU substantive uh, immigration laws can be relied upon, um, I'll begin firstly with some words uh, by which I attempt to contextualise the topic, right? Setting out the nature and scope of the general legal framework uh, of the regulation of AI-based decision-making uh, and the challenges um, to which it gives rise. Uh, I'll then go on to set out this doctrinal framework of anti-discrimination law, 
Um, that's to say, setting out the legal rights of individuals that are uh, created and defined by uh, by those sets of law. Um, and in so doing, I'll try to bring to the fore some of the the, the key challenges, um, both from the perspective of AI, but also from the perspective of legal regulation generally in uh, regulating AI-based decision making. Um, thereafter, I'll kind of try to switch to the procedural law dimension. Uh, setting out the processes within, as I said, uh, the English law context by which an individual, if they consider their um, rights, equality rights, rights to non-discrimination uh, to have been infringed, can engage uh, the relevant dispute resolution authorities to enforce uh, those rights. Um, and in so doing, then I'll highlight uh, some of the key procedural law challenges that arise in the context uh, of enforcing uh, those uh, infringements specifically in relation to AI-based decision-making. And finally, um, I'll draw some conclusions on uh, specific areas uh, for reform. Um, one thing I wanted to note is I had the intention at some point uh, to look into the European Commission's most recent um, lawmaking endeavour in this area, which some of which some of you will be aware, the um, proposal for regulation uh, on artificial intelligence. Um, and necessarily kind of given the limits of, of time uh, today, I think it's probably best to leave that for, uh, for another day. But it's worth noting that from the procedural law perspective, it does seem to give rise to a kind of different approach to uh, the one that has been prominent uh, in relation to, to the enforcement of, of anti-discrimination rights. Um, one other thing I want to note is um, Throughout, I'll make some reference to kind of key pieces of legislation and key judgments um, of the courts. However, I guess kind of unlike a very typical legal research presentation, um, I don't want to get too bogged down in specific legal rules. Instead, what I'll do is I'll put um, I'll put uh, references in the PowerPoint and I'll um, make this available to Sierra for you uh, to to access um, should you want to. Um, okay, so uh, kind of beginning by contextualizing the calls for regulating uh, AI based decision making and uh, the general challenges to which uh, regulation gives rise. Um, the calls for legal regulation, right? I'm sure you're all aware, uh, broadly understood, you know, not giving much information on what form that regulation should take. Uh, have been widespread, right? As you can see um, from, uh, there's nothing new here, from national and regional lawmakers uh, to NGOs, civil society bodies, academia, uh, industry actors, uh, big tech, et cetera, et cetera. There are kind of widespread broad calls um, for, uh, for legal regulation. Um, more specifically, I think there's equally a um, uh, Similarly, widespread recognition that AI-based decision-making poses uh, risks to fundamental rights um, and in particular to the protection of equality and non-discrimination. Again, um, there's a broad recognition and here I've just given reference uh, or made reference to um, these acknowledgements by the EU institutions, by the European Commission um, and the European Parliament. Uh, as well as uh, the Council of Europe, so the kind of uh, European Convention on Human Rights bodies um, on the, the potential risks uh, that AI-based decision-making poses um, as regards uh, equality, but equally other um, relevant fundamental rights which have come to be recognized, and we'll see in a couple of minutes, as kind of key fundamental values um, of at least European society. Um, similar findings uh, can be found, or similar findings can be identified in the literature. Um, as was mentioned in uh, Krishna's, I think the first lecture of yesterday morning um, in, uh, for example, Cathy and Neil's weapons of mass destruction, right? Where there's this kind of uh, demonstration therein of the risk that uh, that the AI poses. 
uh, to fundamental rights, particularly uh, in the US. So in light um, of these, uh, in light of these reflections, I will necessarily kind of take for granted um, the idea that more or less for time's sake, right? We'll take for granted um, the idea that AI-based decision making can generate a, at least a risk of discrimination to individuals. Um, not necessarily that legally it is necessarily easier, it would be found that uh, to be discriminatory, but that at least it poses or it generates a risk of such uh, a negative outcome. Um, as I'm equally sure uh, you might be aware, but I found it useful just to to, to kind of elaborate um, a little bit on that. Uh, a number of, of typologies have been alliterated uh, or elaborated uh, upon within the literature um, to describe uh, how this by what the the bias that is uh, how to categorize, let's say, the bias that might be inherent. Uh, in um, these algorithms and which can give rise to uh, to this risk of discrimination, right? Um, how either the code or the data can be biased, um, thus kind of inserting discrimination into algorithmic operations, whether that arises uh, from biased, incomplete or non-representative training data from existing structural or systematic uh, discrimination, which is then kind of amplified uh, by the use of AI. And um, of course, as we'll see, and as we know, um, this is particularly pertinent given the kind of ubiquity or ubiquitous nature of AI-based decision-making, right? Whether this exists in relation, as we can see from the examples and there are th these examples, which are kind of the well-known ones, um, whether this, the, the, this, these algorithms are used uh, in um, recruitment systems, in uh, relation to uh, criminal proceedings, in uh, healthcare management, in asylum and consumer credit applications, uh, school applications, and so on and so forth. So from both the kind of calls for regulation and the acknowledgement of the risk that uh, fundamental rights, the risk to fundamental rights, sorry, um, we might well accept the regulation uh, is needed. Um, on this acceptance, however, this gives rise from a legal perspective to uh, various other uh, considerations. And here I'll deal with uh, two of them uh, in particular. The first concerns the kind of challenges of regulating AI um, or AI-based decision making. And the second concerns how it should be regulated. So while we might accept and acknowledge these calls for regulation, um, what these calls don't tell us is what form this regulation should take, right? And this takes us to another question or a kind of sub-question. Um, and that, I guess, forms part of the key, or one of the key dimensions of this lecture is what already exists in terms of the legal framework um, and is it satisfactory? Is it fit for purpose or is there a need uh, for further reform? So. We can begin with the challenges of regulating AI, and I'm sure um, there are challenges with which uh, you are um, aware. They're multiple um, and pertain both to the nature of AI-based decision-making and the nature of legal regulation uh, itself. Um, and I'm not sure if it's available to everyone, but I uh, found um, the presentation that Christian uh, gave in, I think it was at the beginning of this year, I think in February, uh, during the onboarding week, um, to be particularly useful, where he set out uh, in quite a lot of detail kind of fundamental challenges uh, of regulating AI-based decision-making, as well as the rationales underpinning uh, legal regulation. Um, and I don't want to necessarily go into or to rehash all of these ideas here. Um, however, I think it's probably worth highlighting at least some of the key considerations that arise and that pertain in particular uh, to anti-discrimination. So as regards um, the, the challenges arising from AI, as we know, 
And as we've just mentioned, the kind of the use of AI based decision making is almost ubiquitous, right? That's to say it's not limited in its application to a specific field, um, but has rather become commonplace in almost all dimensions of our everyday life, uh, both in the kind of public uh, sphere and also uh, in private sectors from uh, as we've just mentioned, asylum applications to credit and job applications to kind of targeted uh, online advertising to school admissions to the delivery of groceries and so on and so forth. Um, as a result, the use or the engagement of AI based decision making generates risks um, arising from across a, from across a number of areas and fields, uh, one of which might well be uh, the risk of discrimination. Uh, against which the law um, or legal regimes seek uh, to protect. So it needs to be highlighted that we can think about the legal regulation of AI in a vacuum, um, but it must be considered in light uh, of the existing and kind of extensive legal framework um, that, that we already have. And that's something that I'll come back to in a couple of minutes. Um, as regards the challenges uh, of legal regulation itself, so of course uh, we know the law is really only one set of mechanisms for the regulation of various uh, social, technical and economic challenges. Um, and largely without kind of engaging in a much deeper uh, discussion on this point, tends to respond to those uh, challenges retrospectively, right? That's to say is the case uh, with AI, um, the technology develops and the law kind of subsequently aims at to respond uh, to the problems uh, that arise from that. Um, secondly, I think the question arises as to whether the law and legal regulation is really fit to promote or to facilitate uh, non-legal standards, right? Um, we talk about the ideas of uh, the development of, a, of an ecosystem of trust, uh, of fairness and equality, and while these are all terms um, which can be found uh, in law, um, we might, I think it is necessary to ask whether um, the law and legal regulation is really up to the ta up to the task of promoting or facilitating what are not only legal but equally uh, moral, philosophical, and ethical uh, standards. Um, fundamentally, uh, also, and again, this is another kind of limitation of uh, legal research. I think um, there are. Uh, necessarily norms of international law, of international human rights law, uh, that aim to protect against uh, certain risks arising from the use of AI, against discrimination in particular, um, and there are EU laws which establish uh, certain rights in these areas, again, for example, rights to equality and protections against discrimination. However, as we'll see, um, as I'll explain in a couple of minutes, these laws need to be implemented within national legal systems. And it's within the context of the national procedural framework that these rights are enforced, right? So we might say that there is um, a challenge which arises from this kind of uh, disconnect between the ubiquitous global stretch and scope of AI-based decision-making and the regional or indeed even national scope of legal uh, regulation. Sorry, I just keep trying to click through. Um, so this uh, brings us to a set of uh, questions on the form of legal regulation. Um, these are the, a couple of the last points kind of on the general legal framework. Um, and again, two kind of questions uh, arise, a couple of them we've already uh, introduced. The first is kind of the, the scope or the sectoral scope of legal rules. Um, and the second issue that arises is their character, right? Where do these rules come from? Who makes them? Um, and what legal form uh, do they take? And we'll see these are all uh, important dimensions of um, how those, how the rights that are established in these laws can uh, ultimately be enforced. Um, so as I 
uh, previously introduced this idea that there's no legal vacuum in which AI or AI based decision making can be regulated, right? Um, nor fundamentally, as regards scope, is there uh, yet an overarching comprehensive legal framework for uh, its regulation. Rather, what we have uh, at the moment, as I uh, kind of, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, is the European Commission's, so the EU legislators' uh, proposal um, for a piece of legislation on the regulation of artificial intelligence. We have at the moment this proposal. Um, it will likely take uh, some time and go through some changes before it becomes, uh, before it's enforced and becomes uh, a piece of EU law. Um, while it might be the case that this proposal for a regulation is uh, intended to be more of an overarching or more of an all-encompassing um, legal instrument. I think nevertheless, it's the case that given the significance of the, uh, the, the variety of legal interests that have to be protected within this particular context, um, I think it's generally already recognized that the regulation uh, in whatever uh, form it eventually takes cannot uh, be all encompassing. But it is important to kind of bear that in mind that there is at the moment uh, this proposal um, of April 2021, which has been made um, by the Commission. Instead, um, what exists at uh, the moment is a kind of multitude or multitude of sectoral regimes from uh, data protection to consumer law to competition law to IP law and of course uh, to anti-discrimination law and these sector specific um, areas of uh, regulation operate alongside a kind of overarching set of legal rules uh, and principles including uh, constitutional law and uh, respect for fundamental rights. So the key question, uh, as I said, is kind of what legal protections already exist in EU law um, and how can they be improved? And this question, I think, has to be posed in light of uh, the understanding that with these different areas of law, with, for example, one regime data protection protecting a particular set of rights and interests and consumer law protecting potentially similar and overlapping rights and interests and competition law doing the same and intellectual property law doing something similar. Um, there, it, there does exist, as we'll see, a kind of fragmentation, right? And at the moment, there isn't a great or necessarily, I would argue, coherent understanding of how each of these regimes uh, interact and interplay. And this is especially true when it comes to the specificities of AI-based decision-making and the challenges to which uh, this gives rise, right? Considering, bearing in mind, um, that these laws were not, uh, at the EU level, these laws were not legislated with um, AI in mind. Again, it comes back to this uh, idea that the law tends to um, either be adopted retrospectively to deal with uh, challenges that have arisen or we try to kind of adapt what already exists to deal with new sets of challenges. Um, so this kind of brings us, I think, to, uh, the, to the second key consideration, which concerns uh, the origin of le these legal rules and the character so uh, of the legal rules. So whether they're international, um, regional, i.e. Uh, deriving from the European Union um, or national in their uh, nature and what form, essentially what legal instruments uh, they engage. Um, and we'll see what I mean by this uh, in just a second. Um, this is really uh, of fundamental importance as regards enforcement because it really th these determinations dictate how the rights deriving from these uh, pieces of legislation can be enforced and in what uh, particular fora, i.e. what fora has uh, the competence to enforce them. Now, 
um, from uh, the perspective of EU law, um, e European Union law is characterized either uh, as primary or secondary uh, law. Uh, primary law, also known um, as EU treaty law, so the, encompassing the, the treaties of um, the, the European Union um, and the binding international agreements entered into between EU member states which set out the, the principles on which the EU's uh, legal and political endeavours are based, right? Establishes the constitutional framework of fundamental rights and freedom, which shape these endeavours um, and sets out, elaborates the objectives of the EU um, and its member states, uh, and fundamentally um, outlines the competencies um, of the EU to legislate uh, for secondary law. So I'm not sure if you can actually see that, but hopefully it's clearer uh, when the um, when you have more access to the PowerPoint. Um, beyond the primary law framework, um, secondary law is the, the kind of category of EU law by which most rights and obligations um, on individuals um, are established. And we'll see um, in, in a couple of uh, minutes that both primary and secondary law provide for rights of non-discrimination and equality. Um, and I'll come back to this, as I said, with some reference to these key pieces of legislation and the rights, uh, the, the substantive rights that they uh, establish. Um, before I do that, it's worth just noting that, um, again, because it's reflective of the, the, the legal form of these laws and is important as regards um, the enforcement of the rights that are set out therein, um, it's important to note that uh, secondary EU law can uh, take various forms. Um, either, uh, again, that's a little bit blurry on the PowerPoint, sorry, um, either as, as regulations, directives, decisions, recommendations and opinions, each having different, um, each being addressed to different sets of parties and each having different effects, particularly um, as regards uh, their kind of binding nature. Um, and how they're implemented within national legal systems. So, uh, from the perspective or engaging in, in research on anti-discrimination, I'm particularly interested in the kind of top two lines of this, uh, this graphic in regulations um, and directives. Those are the two kind of key legal instruments by which the EU legislature has, um, has established rights uh, of equality. And um, the choice of legal instrument by which EU secondary EU law, by which EU secondary law is adopted, um, is significant uh, for um, a couple of reasons. Firstly, um, the determination of the legal instrument shapes whether there's a need uh, for a further step of implementation within a national legal system in order for that law to be relied upon and be in deemed to be enforceable by individuals. So just to make the key distinction between regulations and directives, um, a regulation is directly applicable within a national legal system uh, as soon as it comes into force. That's to say there's no need for any further uh, step by the national legislator. In contrast, uh, a law which takes the form of a directive uh, must be implemented in national law. That's to say the national legislature needs to take a further um, step, uh, needs to take further action and adopt a piece of national law um, in order to implement that EU law into uh, the domestic context, essentially in order to put that uh, EU directive uh, into force within the national legal system and to allow uh, individuals uh, to rely on it. Um, the second kind of key characteristic is uh, that the degree of harmonization, um, i.e. The, 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 the degree of the harmonized set of rules um, that the EU uh, might provide for can diverge depending on uh, the the legal instrument adopted. Uh, regulations tend, and I'm 
being kind of very simplistic here, but regulations tend to provide for a fully harmonized set of rules, which are applicable in the same way across each and every EU member state and within their national legal systems without, as I said, further national legislative action. In contrast, directives tend to give a bit more leeway, a bit more discretion to the national legislators when they're taking that necessary additional step in adopting national law to implement that EU law, which potentially results in the existence of different levels, different standards across uh, national uh, legal systems. Um, so, as regards enforcement and the significance of uh, the, the legal instrument adopted, um, the legal instrument of secondary law is really also uh, important, as I said, from the procedural law perspective, uh, when it comes to the enforcement of the rights that are established uh, in that piece of law. Um, it's worth, and I'm just taking some of this really basically from, from uh, the, the legal literature, um, it's worth mentioning that when we think about EU law, we tend to think about uh, it, it as a kind of hybrid notion, right? A hybrid notion of rights and remedies, which is to say, um, and again, very simplistically, while the right might derive from the EU level, from substantive EU law, it's necessary to enforce that right and seek a remedy within a national legal system, right? So we have this kind of hybrid approach uh, to the enforcement uh, of um of EU law and of EU law rights. Um, the right deriving from EU law and the remedy uh, deriving uh, from the national legal system normally enforced before a national court uh, or administrative uh, authority. Again, uh, as I said, in line with national procedural law rules, which themselves are um, generally not harmonized or if at all in a very limited way. Um, which again uh, leads to a kind of further uh, consideration. Um, what or the way in which we tend to characterize uh, the EU law framework is um, one of fragmentation, right? That we, we tend to, to speak of EU law and, and even international law as, as uh, being fragmented to a certain uh, degree. Um, and that's probably particularly true when we try to identify a, a legal regime or even a set of legal regimes uh, for the regulation of AI. Um, that in fact, what we have is this fragmented landscape um, of regulation, um, of regulatory uh, sectors, each of which is made up um, of specific pieces of legislation uh, derived from the EU level and to be implemented within national legal systems and within and uh, whereby each of which each kind of sector specific uh, regime aims at satisfying uh, certain uh, objectives none of which really are specifically concerned with uh, artificial intelligence right it might be that AI gives rise uh, to risks as we've said to interests which are kind of already uh, protected within these areas of regulation, but that the law itself is not necessarily uh, concerned or specifically concerned uh, with AI. At least this is true um, in relation to the existing uh, regimes, right? As we said, the kind of proposal for regulation on AI that's just been uh, published by the European Commission um, can be said to be slightly different. This is aimed, that is aimed at uh, aimed at the, the, the challenges and risks arising specifically from uh, artificial intelligence. <clears throat> okay, um, so again, we come back to this question uh, posed above. Um, in light of the, the notion that kind of neither AI nor the regulation of, of AI can operate in a vacuum, uh, the key question that uh, we have, the key question for the, the international um, European or national researcher um, really is the following. Um, 
what does the existing legal framework uh, provide for? Um, are these rules able to address the risks uh, of AI-based uh, decision-making? And fundamentally, uh, can they be infect effectively uh, enforced? Or um, are certain adaptations necessary, certain adaptations of the existing rules, certain amendments of the existing rules uh, required? Um, who is it that should do that? Is it the courts, national courts, national legislators, uh, EU courts, uh, EU legislators, um, or indeed are instead a new set of rules uh, required? Is you know simple amendments um, of the rules through interpretation, through legal interpretation, uh, not enough? Is it in fact the case that what we need is a new set um, of legal rules encompassing you know uh, potentially a, a kind of newly developed uh, legal regime? Um, for this, then, it's kind of necessary to come back uh, or to come back to examine the, the doctrinal legal framework of anti-discrimination law. Um, so the rules uh, and how they have uh, been legislated for, as, as I said, as they currently uh, stand. Um, this entails a kind of assessment of how these rules uh, that uh, aim to ensure that AI decision-making, AI-based decision-making processes comply with anti-discrimination uh, norms, as well as with fundamental rights. And as I said, whether those rules fit um, with the specificities and demands of AI, um, as well as the risks that it generates and the, the legal regime's uh, fitness um, for purpose. So it's worth noting, um, getting in kind of to the substantive dimension of uh, anti-discrimination. Uh, the, the theoretical bases of anti-discrimination law uh, are diverse. Um, I necessarily don't have uh, any time to deal with them here, but what can be said is that, in fact, it's a relatively recent um, area of law, uh, one that's been developed in response to specific harms uh, arising in respect of particular groups. Um, and this is kind of well established uh, in the literature. Uh, Arnold Dortier, in fact, explains this or conceptualizes this as kind of three phases of um, European anti-discrimination law, uh, beginning um, with uh, legislation uh, on equal pay and the development of the principle uh, of equality, um, which have uh, and the development of these laws through the European Union legislature and um, through the interpretative role of the European uh, Court uh, of Justice. Um, to that end, it's kind of uh, equally uh, worth noting um, the importance of uh, non-discrimination um, as a key dimension of uh, fundamental rights and as a key value uh, of European identity, um, and particularly from the EU perspective, as uh, a key dimension um, of the internal market. Um, and this is provided for in, in various provisions um, of international uh, law, including the European Convention on Human Rights, as you can see here in Article uh, 14, um, as well as in uh, primary EU law including uh, in the EU treaties and the EU uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. Um, so fundamentally, what's important as regards to the background of anti-discrimination law, um, anti-discrimination law has developed in this kind of piecemeal way, right, um, in response to certain challenges that have uh, come to the fore um, as regards certain uh, groups of individuals beginning with this, uh, the development of uh, the right to equality in as regards equal pay. Uh, Anti-discrimination law has really been kind of well established um, as, uh, as a key value, a fundamental value of the European Union. Um, on the one hand, from the perspective of the, the EU legislator, um, as regards uh, the, the economic objectives that anti-discrimination law can uh, satisfy as regard in relation to the facilitation of the internal market or the single uh, market. 
with the European Court of Justice, the kind of arbiter of uh, arbiter and interpreter of EU law, um, recognizing on the other hand the kind of social human rights dimension of uh, non-discrimination law, finding that uh, non-discrimination constitutes um, a general principle uh, of EU law. Um, over the next couple of slides, I, I'm going to set out just for your reference, but I won't deal with them in any detail because it's really a matter of kind of reading text off of a slide and, and I don't want to, 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 to necessarily do that, but I did want to provide you um, with these references. You can see that we can find, um, we can identify different provisions on equality and non-discrimination um, in various pieces of international law, as I just mentioned, in the European Convention on Human Rights in Article 14, and in primary EU law. Um, so I will just kind of click through these slides um, quite quickly. Um, they provide for a kind of, it, it, the text might well be different and there are various different ways to interpret uh, the text of these provisions. But what I will do is, obviously, as I said, I'm going to make the PowerPoint available and then I will come back in uh, a couple of seconds just to kind of conceptualise what we can identify uh, from each of these uh, provisions. So as we can see, we can find um, or we can see, uh, firstly, Article 14 um, of the Convention. Um, provides for the, the, the enjoyment of uh, the rights and freedoms in the Convention uh, without uh, discrimination. We can identify they're in uh, certain uh, protected grounds. Um, similarly, as I said, in primary EU law, in the treaties of the EU, uh, we can see, again, reference to uh, non-discrimination as a value uh, of the EU, as a value which is common to the member states, so a, a kind of shared value of uh, the, the national legal systems and of national societies. Um, Article uh, 10 of the treaty, of another treaty of the EU, the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU, um, establishes uh, the, the kind of combating of discrimination as a basis on which uh, the European Union can uh, take certain actions, right, can engage in certain uh, endeavours. Um, again, uh, reflected uh, in Article 19, um, which essentially sets out the procedure by which uh, legislation, by which laws can adopt it. Again, discrimination or combating of discrimination recognised as a, a legitimate basis on which um, the union can take action. Uh, and fundamentally, um, we can also refer to uh, another piece of primary law, uh, the, the Charter of Fundamental Rights, the EU Charter uh, of Fundamental Rights, um, which also constitutes or also has the status of EU primary law and has the same kind of legal value um, of the, the, uh, the EU treaties. Um, it's worth noting that um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights applies both to bind um, the institutions of the EU, as well as member states uh, who are required to ensure that their actions and any decisions that they take are compliant with the provisions uh, of the Charter for member states only when they're engaged in the implementation of EU law. But we can see um, that the Charter in various provisions, Article 10, 20, 21, 23, um, makes reference uh, to these uh, provisions um, of equality uh, or non-discrimination. Uh, what, uh, what can we take from um, these, just go back, what can we take from uh, these uh, provisions, from these uh, international law or primary treaty law provisions? Um, the treaties, and in particular, um, the Charter of Fundamental Rights have established principles of equality and non-discrimination as kind of key values uh, 
um, of the EU um, and have attributed to the EU institutions the competence to legislate to tackle discrimination, right, in particular areas and by establishing protected grounds. So this primary law essentially provides the foundational laws and general principles on which EU secondary uh, laws are made. And I will turn to this secondary law quite uh, quickly again. Oh, sorry, again, that's that image is a little bit blurry. Um, but what it shows essentially is that uh, there are five key directives that establish the framework um, of anti-discrimination. Um, as we mentioned, because these laws take the form of directives, there is a need for an additional step at the national level um, to implement that law within the domestic legal system. So the legislation will not automatically apply in the legal systems of the member states. Instead, the national legislator has to draft and adopt law um, to implement these, uh, these anti-discrimination directives. So, as I said, there are kind of key, five key directives that uh, are currently um, operational, uh, each of which apply in a particular field and provide for specific protected grounds. Um, it's worth noting that uh, the Union, the European Commission did pro make a proposal for a broader um, directive uh, against discrimination um, in 2008, so what, almost 13 years ago, uh, which has not yet been adopted. I think it's kind of in this perpetual pause uh, mode. Um, but what instead we, we have at the moment um, is uh, specific directives providing for um, specific protected grounds and operational in uh, limited uh, fields of protection. And I will come back to that uh, in just a second. Now, I said um, I would be examining this implementation fundamentally from the perspective of, of English law. Um, and as I mentioned, these directives have to be implemented within national legal systems. This has been done uh, in England um, fundamentally via two key pieces of legislation, uh, the Equality Act uh, of 2006, um, and all of these directives have kind of been consolidated in a single piece of legislation in the Equality Act of 2010. Um, the Human Rights Act of 1998, from an English law perspective, is also uh, important. Um, it's uh, to the extent that it incorporates the rights set out in the European Convention on Human Rights uh, into domestic law, into English law, um, and it allows individuals uh, within the English legal system to rely on those rights of the Convention before the English courts, and then subsequently, if necessary, to take uh, a case to Strasbourg, to the European Court of Human Rights uh, in Strasbourg. So um, what can we take from these secondary law provisions then? Is there a kind of common understanding of non-discrimination? Um, what we can see is that uh, the EU equality and anti-discrimination um, law directives prohibits discrimination for certain and distinct protected groups in limited uh, and specific spheres spheres. Um, so it's kind of necessary to uh, distinguish and it's rather set up set out uh, in the the table that was on the previous uh, slides um, to distinguish discrimination in the field of employment, discrimination in the field of uh, consumption, supply of goods uh, and services, discrimination uh, in the fields of uh, education, media uh, and advertising. And in relation to these uh, specific fields, there are protections for um, distinct uh, so-called protected groups uh, of individuals. What does that entail then? That there are necessarily certain uh, limits uh, applicable. Um, the non-discrimination framework then doesn't prohibit discrimination in all areas 
uh, in which AI based decision making uh, might be permanent, but pertinent, but only in specific fields. As I said, uh, employment, access to goods and services, uh, social security and free movement by virtue um, of the treaties. And in relation to these specific fields, only as regards uh, certain protected uh, groups. Where AI based decision making then affects an area of law or a field which falls outside of the um, outside of these fields or these groups, uh, the application of EU anti discrimination law is limited. Um, and as such, uh, where AI based decision making might impact a group that is not protected. Uh, it might then escape the, the clause of EU law. Um, indeed, it can be said, I think, that there are uh, certain types of uh, differential treatment, differentiations that might arise in the context of AI-based decision-making, but which might not be caught by EU uh, anti-discrimination law, even if it has a negative impact or prejudicial effects um, for one of these reasons, right? Um, we can take uh, the example of uh, um, uh, for example, uh, as had been recognized in a, in a report of the Financial Conduct Authority um, on AI based decision making and insurance from 2016, I think, um, spelling errors on insurance applications, the use of a particular browser, postal codes, um, are seen to be specific types of, of uh, data uh, engaged in a particular uh, process of decision making, um, but which aren't caught necessarily uh, by, um, or which do not fall within one of the protected groups um, recognized uh, by um, these EU law uh, directives. Um, moreover, it's worth noting kind of very briefly, um, given this kind of single ground approach uh, that's adopted, given this idea that individuals have to fall into one of these protected grounds, um, anti-discrimination law does not, uh, cannot uh, deal adequately with uh, the notion of intersectionality, right? If an individual falls within or at the intersection of a number of groups, um, anti discrimination law does not adequately deal with this, with the potential discrimination um, that arises, where people are discriminated against by virtue uh, of one or more characteristics that are part of or are perceived to be part of um, their identity. Um, one, uh, one kind of further issue that I want, or one further kind of conceptualization, conceptual challenge that arises from anti-discrimination law um, before I move uh, in more detail to the procedural law framework is this distinction which is drawn in EU law between direct and indirect discrimination. So I'll briefly set these concepts out and then return to kind of unpack and analyze them from a procedural law perspective uh, in a couple of minutes. So. Direct discrimination um, arises when a person is treated less favorably than another has been or would have been in a comparable situation. We have a definition of this uh, in Article 2.2a of the Racial Equality Directive. Um, and we can see from this concept, uh, from this definition, that there are a number of terms that kind of have to be unpacked, right? What's meant by left, less favorably? favorably, what's meant by comparable situation, how do we engage um, in this uh, comparison. Um, as I said, I'll come back to this uh, in uh, a couple of minutes. On the other hand, or the second kind of conceptualization, um, again, we can find reference to it uh, in the directives, just an example here in Article 22b of the same directive, the Racial Equality Directive. Um, we have this concept of indirect discrimination, right? Which is deemed to arise where there's this apparently neutral provision, criterion or uh, practice that would have the effect of placing um, persons belonging to a, to a protected group or category at a particular disadvantage when compared uh, to others. Again, 
there are dimensions of this conceptualization that need to be unpacked. The idea, for example, of a neutral provision, the engagement of a comparison, as well fundamentally as we can see the key difference between direct and indirect discrimination is that indirect discrimination can be justified if it occurs for reasons of fulfilling an objective and legitimate claim. Now, um, both of these types, concepts of discrimination uh, give rise to um, key procedural challenges as regards the shaping of the claim that is made um, by the person, by the victim of uh, discrimination, right, by the person who has been harmed by this discriminatory practice um, or outcome. Within anti-discrimination law and in bringing a claim, as we'll see, there's a need to establish a kind of prima facie instance of discrimination, a prima facie case of discrimination. And the kind of key questions that arise and that I want to elaborate on a little bit more in the time that I have left um, is how can it be shown uh, how can this prima facie claim of discrimination be established? Um, how can it be shown first that a decision is made by artificial intelligence? Uh, secondly, that the uh, that the AI based decision making is either directly or indirectly discriminatory, which demands or which assumes, of course, that the disadvantage arises in one of the fields and negatively impacts a member of a protected group as established by the directives. So already kind of limiting um, the scope. This kind of key procedural challenge as regards uh, the claim being made by the victim um, is one which I will come back to in just a couple of minutes. Instead, now I want to uh, look in more detail at uh, the, the procedural uh, law framework um, firstly, uh, the general right to an effective remedy that's established in EU primary and secondary law. Um, and then I want to look at a little bit more detail at the nature of the procedure for bringing a claim for the violation of anti-discrimination law uh, in England. And in kind of unpacking this bringing of a claim, um, I want to look at certain procedural issues including uh, jurisdiction, um, essentially what court is competent to hear the case and render a binding judgment, uh, issues of standing, uh, that's to say identifying the parties to the claim, uh, the claimant uh, and the defendant in uh, legal terminology. Uh, as I just mentioned, the content of the claim itself, how do we establish a prima facie claim uh, of or prima facie instance of discrimination? Uh, the remedies that might be sought by the, the victim um, as well, to the extent that I have time, I realise uh, I'm kind of running out of time a little bit, other issues which constitute procedural obstacles, procedural challenges to bringing a claim like timing, uh, the costs of going to court and the needs and costs of legal representation, right, of engaging a lawyer to uh, either act on your behalf or to provide uh, legal advice. Um, so this notion of uh, access to justice, fundamentally, um, the respect for fundamental rights in the EU has to be uh, effective. That's to say when a person's rights are violated, he or she should have the right or they should have the right to seek redress for that violation before um, either an administrative body uh, or a court or tribunal. I'm focused on the latter in the court uh, or tribunal mechanism of dispute resolution and before that body, before that forum to seek an effective uh, remedy. So we have reference to this notion of access to justice uh, in Article 47 um, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And essentially it kind of reinforces this idea, right, that rights are rights have to be able to be effectively enforced um, and necessarily what is engaged in that uh, enforcement is that there are you know effective proportionate and dissuasive remedies available in respect of the violation of uh, an individual's uh, rights so we have reference to this in uh, in primary law in article 47 uh, of the charter 
Mm. And um, it's also recognized in the English common law, right? Um, just two cases uh, as examples, two kind of fundamental cases of um, the English courts, the idea uh, that every individual should have a right to access a court um, in order to seek redress for the violation of their rights. The idea that this right of access to a court constitutes uh, essentially uh, in England, where we have this unwritten constitution, right? Nevertheless, a constitutional uh, right. This isn't uh, necessarily a right which is unlimited though, um, that the courts have also recognized that these rights can be limited by virtue of, uh, in particular, by virtue of the procedural uh, law rules relating to uh, court fees, costs, timing, prescription periods, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can also find uh, reference to this notion uh, of access to justice in uh, relevant EU secondary law. So again, um, I'll come back to the, the racial equality directive. Uh, Article 7 of that directive establishes, um, and I, I, I won't necessarily read it, but essentially the member states are obliged to ensure um, that there does exist either judicial, uh, i.e. court-based or administrative procedures for the enforcement um, of uh, the rights established under the directives, right? That these uh, procedures are available to uh, to individuals who consider that they have been um, that their rights uh, to non discrimination, their rights to equality, uh, have been violated. So we find these provisions on access to justice both in primary law and in secondary law, the idea that access to justice is a kind of fundamental key legal principle of, um, of the EU, but also of uh, national legal systems is, uh, is generally well established. Now, um, as I said, I'm focusing on what we term kind of private enforcement, right? Fundamentally, that is to say, uh, judicial enforcement, judicial procedures, procedures, as opposed to um, administrative procedures. Fundamentally, because that is what um, is prominent and what is predominant at the moment. So the key mechanism now, at least within England and Wales, for enforcing rights derived from EU law has been um, privately, engaging individual rights and enforcing them uh, through the courts. Now, there has been something of a shift in focus from the European Commission in recent years to um, all, what's termed alternative dispute resolution, so dispute resolution outside um, of national courts for reasons of uh, cost, speed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we can kind of see this shift, I think, uh, also in the Commission's uh, proposal for regulation on artificial intelligence. But again, I think that's probably uh, for, for a different uh, day. Um, but this approach to the enforcement of uh, EU law rights and substantive EU law rights has been reinforced by um, the European Court of Justice, right, in various case laws, uh, in various cases and judgments um, with which, if you're a lawyer, you will more than likely uh, be um, familiar. Um, whereby the European Court of Justice has established this notion that, uh, yes, individuals can, in fact, uh, take these substantive law rights uh, found in regulations or directives when they've been implemented in national legal systems and go before a national court uh, and enforce them. Um, against either the state or another uh, private individual. Uh, again, a very kind of simplistic uh, explanation of, um, of the role of the European Court of Justice there. But fundamentally, focus on um, the approach or the, the enforcement of those rights before national courts, as that has been the kind of predominant uh, mechanism for enforcing um, 
these rights to equality and non-discrimination. Um, in England, it's worth noting that uh, when it comes to taking a case to court, discrimination is deemed to be a civil law matter. Um, thus, it's not a criminal law matter. It's generally not administrative. Uh, so the courts are engaged on the basis of their civil jurisdiction. Uh, what's that to say? Fundamentally, uh, it's not criminal. The police are not involved. Um, administrative bodies tend uh, not to be involved. It's really the, the English courts engaging their civil law competence. Um, so, as we've explained, substantive rights are derived from the EU directives um, and from uh, the Equality Act of 2010, as those rights have been implemented uh, in English law. On the other hand, and as I mentioned, procedure, the, the procedural law framework is really um, shaped by national law, by English law. Um, and in the English legal system, the procedural law rules that shape civil law cases in English courts are found in the civil procedure rules, um, which I will provide a link to for any of you who are interested. Uh, it's really a set of rules which are supplemented uh, by what are known as practice directions, which provides kind of very detailed information on the legal processes and legal procedures uh, before the English courts, right? The aim um, of these uh, civil procedure rules is really to try to achieve consistency in practice, right? In, in cases that are heard before the courts, again, a key dimension uh, of access to justice and to ensure that courts can deal with cases uh, in what is deemed to be a just way, right? To ensure that parties uh, are on an equal footing to avoid unnecessary expenses, um, to deal with cases in a way which um, are proportionate to the value of the claim, the amount of money essentially that's involved, the importance and complexity uh, of the case and the issues that are arising uh, therein, uh, the financial position of each of the parties, uh, making sure that the case to the extent that it's possible is dealt with uh, making sure that it's dealt with fairly, but also uh, quickly. Um, and uh, fundamentally, and again, another reason why procedural law tends to be national is very much tied to uh, the resources attributed to national dispute resolution systems, right? In procedure, there's really, um, I mean, fundamentally, a kind of very political dimension to uh, to those rules as well and how they operate. The amount of uh, resources that are attributed uh, to particular courts, um, the, the importance that a particular case is deemed uh, to have, uh, ensuring that you know, one case doesn't take up the vast majority of the time of a particular court and that there's this kind of sharing um, of resources. So this is, these are the aims of these rules of, uh, of civil procedure when it comes to bringing uh, a case before a court. Um, it's worth noting that, uh, as I mentioned, there has been this shift to alternative dispute resolution to ADR, uh, or a shift in focus, rather, I should say. Um, some uh, Within some legal systems, I think in Austria in particular, regarding certain types of discrimination claims, it's necessary, it's actually mandatory that individuals who are uh, alleging their rights have been violated, go before an alternative dispute resolution forum um, and have to engage these proceedings before they actually go to court, right? So sometimes before an individual can actually go to court, it's necessary that they go to an alternative uh, forum and try to resolve uh, their claim essentially in a more, um, in a less adversarial way, right? And without engaging the cost of uh, court proceedings, the cost of lawyers and so on and so forth, but they kind of in try to resolve their dispute via uh, conciliation, mediation, um, or even arbitration. Um, in England, it's not the case necessarily that uh, individuals have to engage these kind of uh, pre-judicial procedures or have to go to these um, alternative dispute resolution fora before they can go to court, except uh, in the case of um, 
well, except in the case of claims of discrimination brought in the context of employment, uh, individuals aren't required necessarily to go to this arbitration advisory conciliation and arbitration service, but they're required before they bring a claim to court, they're required to advise uh, the service that they have, um, that they are bringing a claim. Um, so it, it's necessary again to consider from a procedural perspective, there might be certain steps that have to be taken before a party takes uh, a case to court. Uh, in some legal systems, courts can in, will, will expect that a party uh, has um, complied with these requirements and can impose fines uh, if parties have not uh, actually done so. And fundamentally, the, the way in which a party decides to try to resolve their dispute right is a question for the party who's, who's allegedly been subject to discrimination. Uh, what is it they're, that they're trying to achieve? Um, what, i.e. what's the remedy that they're seeking and how quickly do they want to achieve it? Uh, there's again something of a dichotomy. I think most lawyers would recommend trying to resolve problems informally at first uh, before going uh, to a court. However, the rules of procedure also provide that there's a limited period within which within which uh, claims of discrimination can be brought uh, before court. So it's also necessary uh, to act uh, quickly. Um, okay. Key kind of procedural issues that arise. Um, the question of standing: who is the claimant and who is the defendant? Essentially, who is the party bringing the claim and who is the party uh, defending it? Um, okay, the the legal system requires uh, that the claimant kind of self-identify themselves um, to the extent that it's the claimant who initiates the the judicial proceedings. Uh, normally, then it's relatively easy to identify the claimant. Typically, that will typically that will be the party who has uh, alleged that they've been discriminated against. Right? That might not necessarily always be the case, but typically that will be the case. The party bringing the claim will be the the victim um, of the discriminatory practices. The identification of the defendant, however, uh, in cases of discrimination. The claimant is required, well, in all cases, the claimant is required to name uh, the defendant um, and provide contact details for them. In the context of AI based decision making, the defendant in a claim of discrimination might be more difficult to identify, right? Is the defendant the user of the AI based decision making, i.e., for example, the bank who engages um, uh, such a model in the context of? credit applications, is it, or in the alternative, is it the developer of the algorithm uh, used? Um, this uh, will likely depend on whether the focus in the claim is on the algorithmic operation itself or on the engagement by the, of the output uh, of that algorithm, which is potentially ultimately made um, by a human, right? So it gives rise to these kind of com this complex relationship between human and uh, machine decision making. Um, fundamentally, though, again, depending on who the defendant, uh, depending on how the defendant is identified, it gives rise to this question as to whether the identification of one of these parties really addresses the kind of fundamental source of uh, discrimination. But there's a key problem, right? A key challenge initially for the claimant in identifying who the defendant is, who exactly is that they're bringing their claim against. Um, yeah, very, very quickly, there is the possibility or additional questions arise in relation to the issue of legal standing, um, organizations promoting equality or uh, anti-discrimination sometimes can play uh, a role in judicial proceedings. Uh, this is also provided for in the Racial Equality Directive in Article 7.2 and again uh, in through English case law that certain uh, NGOs acting in the public interest um, can in England not bring actions on behalf of individuals, but they can provide support to individuals uh, in judicial proceedings. It's essentially uh, engaged as some kind of uh, third party uh, intervention, right? They can bring, they can make arguments, submit legal arguments before the court in support uh, of the claimant. Um, 
yeah sorry realize uh yeah a really potentially the key question of uh procedure um what court is it that is competent to hear the case? Um, what, what court has the power to hear the case and to render a decision uh, in relation to it? Um, now, the rules of civil procedure provide for various sets of uh, rules on jurisdiction, um, which may depend on where the parties uh, are established, when the, where the discrimination took place and the field in which the discrimination uh, has taken place. Um, for example, if it's in the field of employment, the employment tribunal uh, has jurisdiction as opposed uh, to the kind of normal uh, courts. Um, otherwise, the determination of the court that can before which the claim should be brought depends really on the value and the complexity um, of the claim being brought. Right in England, um, it's very much dependent on the amount. Uh, of damages sought by the claimant. Uh, so the remedy essentially sought by the claimant, if it's less than £100,000, uh, the county courts, essentially the local courts have jurisdiction. Uh, if it's more than £100,000, the high court uh, has jurisdiction. And that value is also deemed to kind of correlate to the complexity uh, of the case. Um, here as well, it's worth noting, I'm speaking uh, of a situation where um, the dispute is wholly domestic, uh, that's probably not going to be the case, right? If we think about Amazon, um, if let's say Amazon is named to be the defendant, Amazon, at least in Europe, has its uh, establishment in Luxembourg, a party, a claimant based in England, that claim is necessarily going to be a kind of cross-border international one. And there is a whole other set um, of private international law rules which determine uh, which courts have jurisdiction in those instances. So that's even a very simplistic uh, example that I've uh, set out. Um, beyond jurisdiction, the nature of the claim being made by the claimant is probably the, the most uh, significant dimension uh, of the procedure, right? Um, As I said earlier, uh, the claimant has to be able to um, establish a prima facie claim of discrimination. Fundamentally, uh, determine whether the claim is one of uh, direct discrimination, whether it's one of indirect discrimination, and establish that they are falling within a protected group um, and that the um, that the discrimination has arisen within uh, one of the protected uh, fields. Um, the claimant does this through the completion uh, of a claim form, which is then sent to the relevant court and then served uh, a, a legal process known as service, uh, served on the defendant for the purposes of uh, initiating proceedings, right? Service is essentially the process by which the defendant becomes aware uh, that legal proceedings have been initiated uh, against him or her. Uh, now, again, I'm not sure that you can see this, but this is the claim form that the claimant has to uh, has to complete. Um, they have to provide kind of uh, uh, information such as the the name, address of the claimant, and the name, address of the defendant, the court that they consider has jurisdiction, and then they have to provide the particulars of a uh, claim. Essentially, they have to establish the prima facie case uh, of discrimination, whether that's direct uh, or indirect discrimination. What challenges exist in establishing this, uh, this um, prima facie case? Fundamentally, um, the key issue, right, is establishing proof. Now, this operates in relation to uh, direct discrimination uh, and indirect discrimination. In relation to both, there's no need to show intent, but the key issue that arises with direct discrimination, right, is this the challenge in identifying that there's less favorable treatment on this comparison. Um, how is this done where we're faced with this uh, with this 
black box problem, right? Um, the claimant is likely then to encounter difficulties in establishing that proof of, of discrimination. Um, pertaining to fundamentally the opacity of AI based decision making, right? How to establish this less favorable treatment or the comparable situation to establish um, direct discrimination. How can this comparison be undertaken? Now, this takes us to, to um, the significance of Alejandro's project um, on the right, right to an explanation uh, as potentially being a, a, a necessary prerequisite for establishing uh, various types of claims, including um, a claim on uh, an anti-discrimination. Um, I'm almost finished, so just uh, I will just take a couple of more minutes just to let you know. Um, similar, uh, similar issues arise in relation to indirect discrimination, right? We have a kind of different concept of indirect discrimination and the scope for uh, its justification. Um, when it comes to establishing a claim of indirect discrimination, two kind of considerations are fundamentally necessary, right? On the surface, uh, there's um, neutral, the uh, veneer, apparent veneer of neutrality. Um, however, and again, there's no need to show uh, an intent to discriminate which results in a situation where indirect discrimination can potentially catch a broader range of AI-based decision-making, uh, which might not be caught uh, by direct discrimination, um, where, for example, the protected characteristic is not integrated into the model as a variable, but nevertheless, uh, the outcome is discriminatory. Um, so indirect discrimination then is rather concerned with the outcome or the effect of the algorithm and not with its parameters or uh, content. Um, so what matters fundamentally um, is the outcome. Arguably with indirect discrimination, and I'm like willing, uh, I, I think this is something that needs to be kind of researched and unpacked further. Um, we don't need to open the black box in order to establish the basis of the claim, right? This is one uh, approach which is kind of taken to differentiate direct and indirect uh, discrimination. Um, once it's this, once this prima facie um, case of uh, indirect discrimination is established, from a procedural perspective, the burden of proof then shifts to the defendant, and it's then for the defendant to establish a justification for that discrimination. Um, As uh, the as there is scope for this uh, justification, the defendant has to show there's an objective justification by a legitimate aim. Um, has to establish that, and then it falls to the court to engage in an assessment of whether those means for achieving that particular aim that the defendant has established are appropriate and necessary. So the court then has to engage in a proportionality assessment of um, the mechanism of the, the means uh, by which the defendant has uh, attempted to satisfy that legitimate aim. Um, essentially has to engage in a proportionality assessment um, as to uh, whether that legitimate aim is appropriate and unnecessary, whether the means for achieving that legitimate aim are appropriate and necessary. Uh, what might these legitimate aims be? Um, within the context of AI-based decision-making, particularly in commercial or business purposes, this could be established, for example, by the need to uh, estimate risk estimate the risk of default on a loan, right? Then it turns to the court to engage whether the, uh, whether the, um, the, the algorithm engaged in this AI-based decision-making is, uh, where it's discriminatory, is proportionate to satisfy this need, this, this legitimate aim, this need to estimate uh, the risk of uh, a default uh, on a loan.
So there are kind of two, three dimensions. First, the establishment of the prima facie claim. Second, the burden of proof then shifts to the defendant to set out what the legitimate aim is, and then to the court to determine whether uh, there is, um, whether those mechanisms are uh, satisfactory. Now, um, yeah, the, 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 the European Court of Justice seems to be unlikely to uh, accept blanket aims as being legitimate and, and proportionate. Uh, essentially, what the courts look for is that a minimum harm uh, has been done. Um, and this is where I kind of come to the question of whether it's it really doesn't become necessary to unpack this or to open this black box, right? There are certain uh, considerations and there's certain data um, that is required to be able to engage in this uh, this proportionality assessment. And this has been recognized by, by the Commission again. Um, this is in its proposal for the regulation on AI, right? That even um, where it comes to establishing or bringing a prima facie claim uh, for uh, indirect discrimination, uh, there is a need uh, to access for the claimant to be able to access. Uh, relevant statistical data and for the court to be able to take that data uh, into account. Um, finally, well, almost finally, uh, but I will go very, very quickly. Um, there is, as we said, a need for effective, proportionate and dissuasive uh, remedies. Um, the Racial Equality Directive establishes that this may include compensation. So the kind of key predominant remedy um, in civil proceedings is uh, generally compensation at uh, damages to compensate the injured party uh, for their uh, loss. Um, the English courts also rec recognize in the context of discrimination claims that there potentially can be um, damages for injury to feelings arising from discrimination. In almost all claims, uh, regardless of whether they're related to discrimination or not, there are claimants incur difficulties in calculating what their loss is, right? But in, for example, an employment law claim, it might be um, loss of wages uh, over the, between a period where maybe someone has uh, left their job or resigned and the time um, within which uh, they are able to find uh, another job. Um, so the primary remedy is damages. Uh, the courts have also identified kind of other um, non-monetary uh, damages, including a declaration or finding of uh, discrimination, uh, recommendations by courts um, to organisations which have been uh, found uh, to have discriminated uh, to take certain steps to kind of remedy um, that uh, discrimination. Um, and uh, equally, it's worth noting this is kind of an administrative uh, remedy. However, the Equality and Human Rights Commission in England and Wales can issue uh, binding compliance notices or agreements uh, between organisations and the Commission requiring uh, that those organisations to cease uh, discriminatory practices. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, there are timing or prescription periods attached to certain claims. These necessarily diverge across national legal systems. Um, generally, in England, uh, claims have to be brought within before a court within a six month period, six months minus one day. Um, so there is a limited time period, right, between uh, which w within which a party uh, can bring or a victim of discrimination can bring a claim. Um, the length of proceedings equally has been considered to be something of a deterrent. Um, there are a couple of reports uh, in certain EU member states where discrimination claims have been uh, before courts for up to uh, three to four years, right? So three to four years um, of uh, litigation for um, a, a discrimination claim seems, uh, seems to really impede uh, access to justice. Um, very finally, costs engaged in litigation can be quite considerable. There are fees for filing a claim, court, fee, court fees um, also to be paid, uh, which depends on the complexity of the case and the value of the claim. Um, England also operates a loser case principle, so the loser 
uh, the party who loses in litigation is required to pay the fees of the other party, which can also be quite considerable. Um, there are a number of reports which uh, cite costs as a fundamental procedural barrier to pursuing cases in general, but also um, lit uh, discrimination claims uh, in particular. Um, I've just set out the, the relevant uh, fees here. So you can see they're really um, they're not insignificant, right? They're, um, I mean, for uh, fees to initiate a claim and then hearing fees, they, they can, you know, all kind of really um, add up. Um, the removal of fees from uh, litigation before the Employment Tribunal has um, been facilitated by virtue of a UK Supreme Court decision. And it's worth just highlighting what significance fees can have on um, claims brought before courts, right? Um, in the fees between, in a kind of four year period between 2013 and 2017, um, fees for claimants in employment tribunals were about 280 euros um, to fail the case and then a thousand euros for the hearing fees. Um, the, U the UK Supreme Court determined for reasons of access to justice that those fees should be, uh, that those fees were unlawful. Um, and since the decision to remove those fees in employment tribunals, claims have increased by 90%, right? So it's very clear that the, the imposition of fees really um, can constitute uh, a, a considerable uh, um, obstacle uh, to bringing a claim. Uh, similarly, um, there are costs involved in obtaining legal representation, which is deemed to be necessary, if not mandatory, in almost uh, uh, every legal system, considering the complexity of bringing uh, an anti-discrimination claim, right? It's uh, the, the kind of steps that we've worked uh, through um, show really that for a layperson, it's probably uh, it would be at least very, very challenging to bring a claim uh, without um, legal representation. Um, finally, uh, I will just uh, stop, Sierra, thanks. Um, I just want to, to, to end on kind of five key points, um, procedural law points, I think, that, that really come to the fore um, and that require clarification. Um, firstly, uh, establishing the claim and uh, proving a prima facie case of discrimination really requires, um, I think, elaboration on transparency obligations and the right to information uh, or to an explanation. Where does this derive from? Potentially from the GDPR. Um, a need for clarification, potentially at the EU level, but also um, within national legal systems as to who might be liable when a claim for discrimination is being brought. As I mentioned, the complexities are kind of uh, exaggerated when it comes to international cases where we come into, um, we, where questions come to the fore as to where can we sue, what national law should apply. Um, yeah, a kind of key fundamental principle, I guess, of access to justice as well is this notion that justice must be seen to be done, which puts a, which attributes, I think, a significance to reporting and to awareness of anti-discrimination cases, also particularly when it's concerned, when they're concerned, when they derive from uh, AI-based decision making. And finally, and it leads, I guess, to what could what would be another presentation, but the the proposal for a regulation on artificial intelligence of the Commission is uh, is it feasible or realistic to rely on private enforcement of um, anti discrimination, but indeed other rights uh, before courts, or is it necessary to look to um, integrating public and private enforcement right, attributing a greater role uh, to the state in um, in uh, ensuring um, that individuals' rights can be enforced and that they are uh, entitled and are able to obtain adequate redress uh, for the violations of their rights. Uh, thank you very much. Um, sorry for going over a little bit. Uh, there's just 
as much as I try to narrow it down, there is still so much uh, content to get through. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, any questions that you have, please, uh, please let me know. Yeah, also, I mean, I would say if you have any questions and I don't know, it doesn't come to you right now, then please um, send me an email. Um, I obviously don't want to go into your break, but um, don't hesitate to send me an email if there's anything that kind of comes up later. Um, I will definitely get back to you.